So it's a pleasure and a privilege to be here to moderate this session. Um, I have great pleasure in welcoming Andrew Porteous and Vidyan Morgan Jones as our two star knee surgeons to this wonderful session. I'm sure you know uh, both of these uh, nationally and internationally renowned knee surgeons quite well. So just a brief introduction of uh, both our guest speakers today. Andrew began his uh, career in South Africa and then uh, had an interest in knee surgery. He has done his fellowships in uh, Bristol and in Australia. He has also traveled extensively for fellowship and advanced training to America and Canada. Uh, he is presently the president of BASC and uh, he predominantly runs a complex tertiary revision knee service that deals with complex arthroplasty, failed knee replacements and focusing on infection. What I also learned today is that Andrew has a love for different types of sports, particularly cricket. And uh, we did say that if we start talking about cricket, then knee replacements will take second priority. So welcome, Andrew. And um, the next speaker is Ridian Morgan Jones. I know Ridian personally for over 12, 13 years now. He was my first mentor when I got chosen as AO faculty. Perhaps you'll remember Ridian in those days uh, with your interest in Elizarovs. So Ridian also did his fellowship in South Africa in osteomyelitis and knee surgery in Australia. He runs a, a complex a tertiary referral uh, practice in Cardiff, dealing with a lot of uh, infected knee replacements. Ridian is one of the pioneers in pushing um, the, the envelope for knee revision surgery and uh, is an advocate of single stage revision in well-selected patients. Um, it's, it's a privilege and a pleasure to have both of you. Uh, so, if I can hand over to Andrew to start the session. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to uh, Nick and to Bios for the, the invitation. I know on, on both uh, behalf of uh, Rudian and myself, uh, it's a great uh, honour and pleasure for us to be here today, uh, recognising the great contribution that all the surgeons with links with India uh, contribute to the, the British uh, orthopaedic fraternity. Um, and also, if I can perhaps pass on our condolences to all those members of the, the Indian community who've um, suffered perhaps harder than most uh, over the, the COVID crisis. Um, what we'd like to do in this, this PJI uh, discussion session, um, predominantly we'll focus on knees because that's uh, essentially what Rudian and I do. Um, but a lot of the principles, I think, are uh, readily applicable to um, to other parts of orthopedics and PJI as well. So what we're going to do is start with a couple of scenarios that I know some of you will be really uh, experienced with arthroplasty and infection, and some of you will want more tips that are useful to you on a day-to-day -day basis. So we'll start with a couple of scenarios um, and discuss through those. We'll move on to a couple of cases to discuss and then perhaps round up with what we think are, are useful take-home messages uh, that you can bring into your, your daily practice. So perhaps if I I'm start with the first scenario and put this to, to Ridian, the, the concept of the, the leaky wound and its link with um, infection, but perhaps if you just look at your, your first um, primary knee replacement, what do you do in terms of trying to prevent this becoming an ongoing problem. So day one or two afterwards, the dressing soaked. Uh, where do you go from there? Well, good afternoon, everybody. And, and I'd like to echo Andrew's sentiments and, and thank you ever so much for the invitation. Uh, this is a not uncommon scenario. And uh, I certainly have a regular uh, concern about dressings that are soaked. I try and have a no-touch policy to leave the dressings intact for as long as I can. Uh, seven, ten days if possible. But when they soak, and they will, you need to have a strategy. And for me, you know, it starts in theatre with a closure. I've moved on to barbed sutures recently, and I think that helps uh, some of what I do. I use um, transamic acid intraoperatively. And despite that, we still get some soap dressings because we do, in this country, uh, worry quite rightly about um, DVTs and the way we use thrombus prophylaxis in the UK is possibly at variance now with other parts of the world. But we do use quite powerful antithrombolytics, and we will see soap dressings and oozing wounds. So my strategy is manifold. I'll first of all stop the physio. I'll put them in bed. I'll give them a splint, a cricket pad, just to stop flexion. 
and I'll stop antithrombolytics for a period. Now, day two, we'd hoped our patients going home by day two, but not everybody can achieve that. And if by day two the wound is leaking, I think you are committed then to keep that patient in for several more days. It's not going to settle straight away. I think you need to rest that leg, rest the patient, and probably commit them for another two or three days in hospital until you're certain the using has stopped. Yeah. In the majority I, of cases, that's all you need to do. Yeah. And I think you're right. It, it's a case of uh, just not um, dismissing it as it, it's leaky, it'll stop at some point. Um, and also the the pressure from management to get them out when you're still worried, because I think we all realise if they do go home and they bounce back two, three, four, five days later and they still you know have bloody dressings and uh, they've fiddled around with it at home, uh, we're then down a, a much darker and complex path. Um, I suppose the, the other thing to consider um, quite early, apart from I'd, I'd obviously do the, the things Ridian's mentioned, I, I'm also quite liberal with using uh, post-op tranexamic acid uh, on the ward. So they'll often get three uh, oral doses, 500 milligrams a day, TDS for 24 hours of tranexamic. Um, and yes, stop the physio. Everything halts because now the number one priority is getting that wound sealed. Uh, and also we'd have quite a low threshold um, at this point for going for a, a negative pressure dressing as well. Um, particularly in in those sort of high risk patients, where occasionally we'd we'd put them on in theatre, but I think certainly if you've got a dressing that when you take off the so soap dressing at forty eight hours and you know it's still got that sort of slight leaking to the um, wetness to the wound when you take it off, um, we tend to go for a negative pressure one as well, and I think that probably is just a, a little added thing we've got these days that can probably help. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great point, Andrew. I think. Um... In terms of the health economics, you know, I think putting a negative pressure on all primaries is a case it's quite hard to make. The uh, high-risk patient, I think, is a very strong case to make. But, you know, if you're day two and you put a negative pressure on, it may save you a day of inpatient care. You may be able to get them home quicker, even if the wound isn't quite there. So you can actually save money by using negative pressures aggressively early in this group of patients. Yeah. And I could ask you, in terms of transamic acid, I agree with you with the post-op orals, and I'm starting to use that more myself. Interoperatively, I use both IV and topical. So I'll have a gram at the start, or one or two grams at the start, and when I close the capsule, I'll inject 10 cc in, into the capsule when I've got my closure. And I think that there's good evidence that both work well. Yeah. And I think also if, you, if you're on that journey of trying to manage without a tourniquet, that more people are sort of on that journey now. Um, having tranexamic soap swabs uh, over your cup bone surfaces also seems to help um, uh, you at least get it customised to the, the more bloody view that you, you're getting. Um, if, if we move on to, uh, this is now uh, 10 days, and you've tried all the bits and pieces, and uh, perhaps the ooze isn't quite so bloody anymore, but it's still a wound that hasn't sealed, uh, and it's still a bit leaky. Um, where are you now in terms of your concern or, or your next step? Yeah, so I think the, the day two patient doesn't worry me. I think with, with good attendance to the patient, the vast majority settle. But you do occasionally get these patients that go from um, a bloody discharge to a serious discharge. And what that tells you is that capsule isn't closed. We've got direct contact between the inside and the outside and vice versa. I think you need to be aggressive with these. And, you know, day 10, I'd probably say day 7. If day 7 you've still got a leaking wound, I think you've got to be aggressive with them. You could argue that maybe negative pressure is aggressive enough. You know, day 7, it's late. Uh, and personally, I would take them back to theatre. I would do a formal washout. And I do that myself. I don't think it's a middle-of-the-night operation. It's consultant-led, elective surgical theatre, uh, wash it out. Uh, I suppose the big question mark is, do you change the bearing? And I think you probably should, uh, because if there is a risk of infection, you want to treat this aggressively. Um, it's a rarity, but I think you have to recognise it happens and happens to us all. Yep. And I, the reason I put 10 was, I think, at seven days, a lot of us might go, but it's still more controversial. I think by the time you get to 10 days, it's becoming more and more clear that 
just sitting on this longer is, is not going to help. Um, if we then move to another scenario that, that always right. seems to happen last thing on a Friday um, is um, someone who comes into A&E to the on-call team um, and uh, they were happy with their knee replacement, um, so no issues with that. But they've recently been a bit unwell, uh, and then they come in with a, a short history, they've got a temperature, raised CRP, uh, and you've got your registrar there at uh, 7 on a Friday night wondering what they should be doing. And for those of us that, that haven't seen an OBS chart on a ward for a while, uh, that's a reducing blood pressure and an increasing pulse rate. Yeah, so, and it's always 7 o'clock on a Friday. Yep. It's never two o'clock on a, on a Tuesday. Yeah. No. <laughs> um, look, this is a septic knee, you know, and it's septic until proved otherwise. And um, this is a sort of knee that you admit you plan the theatre uh, when it's safe to do so. Uh, you've got to make sure that they're stable, but they may not stabilise until you deprive the infection. And this is an inf deep infected joint until proved otherwise. Um, the question I've got, Andrew, is, you know, I, I would aspirate. I, I, point of access, uh, send it off. I'd go for broad spectrum antibiotics in the theater, send multiple samples. But for me, look, this is an infect, a deep infected joint until proved otherwise you're aggressive. And look, seven o'clock on a Friday, you go that evening or first thing in the morning, it, depending on local circumstance, the patient stability, access to theater, uh, but mainly the clinical scenario. Yeah, look, I think one of the... I think one of the uh, the differences for me here is sort of uh, whether you are treating the infection or initially we're just treating sepsis and stabilizing a septic patient. So I think there there is a, a difference between what you're trying to achieve with this patient. So uh, certainly at, at that time of night on a, a Friday, I'd be saying that the definitive attempt at clearing the infection doesn't happen until the right person is there to do it. Um, but they need IV access, they need their urine uh, output checked, they need the, the support and perhaps input from ITU because they're decompensating as a, a septic patient. And yes, you ideally want an aspirate first because then you can put them on antibiotics. And if you're not managing to stabilise them and control their general condition, then they may well need a... Uh, washout or an open washout or something to decompress or reduce bacterial load and stop them dying and having organ failure. Um, but that is sort of a first aid thing. And your proper definitive attempt at clearing the infection is something that could then perhaps be delayed for the Saturday if you've got an experienced arthroplasty person around or if you've actually decompress the load, they've been on ITU, their kidneys are good, they're on antibiotics and they're stable, you could do their definitive dare or first stage or whatever you're going to do on the Monday or Tuesday. Well, I'd agree with that. I think this is probably the one role for arthroscopy in PGI. It's yep. a stabilising procedure. I mean, the what I have seen in the past, though, is that uh, the arthroscopic debris more than mini washer works really well. The patient is clinically better. And then you're lulled in this false sense of security because you've yeah, made them clinically better, but the deep infection is still there. And again, you give them a prolonged course of antibiotics and they stay well, but it'll come back. Yeah. So temporary measures are exactly that. It's not instead of definitive surgery. And you can argue dare, one stage, two stage, but you need to have a definitive procedure, as you said, by, by the right surgeon at the right time. Yeah. So I think for the on-call guy, treat the sepsis, get a bug, start the antibiotics and do a first aid wash out of some description if you have to, um, but don't be conned into thinking that that's treated the infection, that needs a proper job uh, at another time. Um, so Andrew, yeah. sometimes um, in some uh, DGHs you don't get the arthroscopy stacker uh, on an evening. Yeah. Would it be acceptable to dry tap the knee with a white bone needle in theatre under full aseptic technique and just aspirate as much pus as you can and then you know you have debulked it and then do all the rest that you have just said but you're not able to formally arthroscopically wash it out. Yeah so I, I think you know that there is some advantage to uh, aspirating to dryness just on the basis that 
pus under pressure is what tends to make you sick. So patients with sinuses almost never become septic. Um, so, you know, there, there's some advantage to that. I, I think if you're actually uh, on a trauma take and you're not familiar with arthroscopy and the stack isn't available, if you even just did a an inch or so incision uh, in the scar above the patella where you've got no soft tissue coverage issues and you just did a sort of mini open and you got your pulse lavage in there uh, and washed things out, then you haven't uh, messed up things for the next step and you've sort of saved the patient's life, you've done their first aid. And particularly if you're talking about someone who is maybe not that familiar with arthroscopy, they're better off doing that than trying to force a, a trocar into a joint replacement and you know and struggling with that. Yeah. So sort of a, a mini open above the patella in the line of the the incision is unlikely to cause harm that your sort of arthroplasty PGI guy would be worried about. The, you know, a couple of days later, if they had to go back. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I think. Um... I would favour mini open arthrotomy, super patella, as Andrew says, over probably a tap. Um, but again, this scenario is not that common. The more common one is the, 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 the low-grade grumbling infection. The patient's systemically well, but you know there's infection there. And, and, the, and again, slightly different scenario. Here we're presented with sepsis. And it's recognising the sepsis and treating it both systemically and locally. Yeah. So if we go on to the, the first sort of case to look at, uh, this is um, one of uh, Ridian's that you'll probably recognise. 68-year-old, uh, no comorbidities, 12-year-old knee replacement, uh, sorry, 12-month-old knee replacement, but it's been painful and swollen ever since. And those are the x-rays there. And the initial uh, investigations appear to be pretty normal. Yeah, uh, sure. um, and do you want to just give us some update on that uh, case or what your concerns were? Yeah, absolutely. So this was, um, as happens, you know, that this uh, patient's uh, daughter was a nurse on my unit and she was worried about her dad. And listen, so it's a, it a good knee replacement, happy, good pain relief, but it's been grumbling. It's been grumbling. And the local surgeon had done a workup, inflammatory markers, full blood count, normal. You know, CRP was, you know, top end of normal, but normal. Um, bone scan, not sure that was the best uh, investigation, reported normal. It's within 12 months, everything's hot. And the surgeon said, look, it, it's a bit angry, it's a bit inflamed, it'll settle, you just need to give it more time. But we're 12 months out and he's still grumbling, the knee's still swelling. And what worried me was that um, looking at these first x-rays was on the medial plateau of the tibia. There's just a little bit of lysis there. And often that's the very first indication of anything going wrong. And I think it happens immediately because we strip that when we do the exposure. So there's a little vascular area there, and that's a great place for infection to start. Um, so having taken the history, examined him, I took some new x-rays uh, and a few clicks forward. And, and again, and there we go. So this is when he came to my clinic. CRP is now 18. It's not normal. It's not awful. His symptoms have worsened. And if you look here, there's progressive lysis. So that same area, immediately, there's now more bone loss. So that's a progressive sign. Clinically, he's much the same. A bit more pain, a bit more swelling. But, you know, it, it wasn't the normal knee. And I think the problem here was because the other surgeon hadn't proven something, he said it must be normal. Well, actually, sometimes you've got to repeat things. And all I did was repeat x-rays, repeat scan, repeat uh, bloods, and the, the picture developed. So here we did an aspiration, and pleocoagal is negative stuff. And that's quite a common one for these low-grade grumbling infections. Um, and I think the, the important bit as well is that the while some patients may just continue to have pain after their knee replacement, to continue to have a swollen knee replacement for a year is a concern. Uh, and certainly, you know, a painful swollen knee within the first year is definitely infected until proven otherwise. Um, so um, as a standard sort of approach, one has to go that extra mile and probably the aspirations a bit that, that pinches the deal. Um, but also, you know, that unless there's another good reason for a CRP of 18, it's exactly what you'd expect with a... Uh, 
a low grade chronic infection. Um, uh, so, 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 so this is actually, and, and uh, if you look at the lateral now, there's lysis behind those posterior condyles as well. And so if you get lysis posterior condyles, lysis medial tibial plateau, I think that's almost diagnostic of an inflammatory condition, infection in the knee. Yeah. So the question I have for myself with this patient, is it a dare, is it a two stage, is it a one stage? Um, and for me, it's not a dare because we have bony involvement and it's a long history. Uh, Andrew, would you agree with that or would you think this is the yeah, rule? I, I, I think the, um, in our sort of take home messages later, we'll, we'll have some of the key bits for dare, but I think it, it also needs to have been a successful, happy knee that you want to salvage, uh, whereas this chap's never been happy. And I think as soon as you start getting lysis at the interface, you can't be sure that this is a well-fixed implant where it's worth putting them through a dare. So I think for me, once I see those lytic areas, particularly the femur is, is more worrying at the back there, um, dares off the menu, and then it's just a debate about one or two stage, which I think, um, you know, there are a couple of uh, criteria where all of us would do one stages or all of us would do two stages. And there are quite a few where you could argue it either way. And it depends a bit on your experience and um, the setup of your unit and the availability of techniques and, and kit and, and so on. Absolutely. So for me, this was a um, 68 year old male, no comorbidities. It was a good organism. There's no skin issues with, with the, uh, the limb. So I went for one stage. And I went for primarily uncemented fixation. Um, and there's the immediate post op x-rays. And it was actually quite remarkable when I explanted the, lys the lysis you saw on the x-ray was only part of it. Yeah. And all around the tibia, there was a significant lysis. Uh, so the tibia literally just popped out. And once I debrided, I was left with a big cavity. And that was the largest plastic sleeve available at the time. Uh, it was adequate, but you know, it was bigger than I was, pl than I was planning. Yeah. And I think it's it's the lysis is always worse than you think. So always. one of the things, Andrew, with this is uh, this is not only a significant clinical problem, but we also encounter this often in medical legal and negligence work. And if you have a chronically painful knee that gets fobbed off for a year, two years, and then the infection becomes more and more established and more and more difficult to treat, that can cause clinical harm to the patient, and then that can become a very expensive medical legal bill. So one of the things that we have is if I do a knee and if he's not happy at um, a time where I expect him to be happy, I have a low threshold of getting a second opinion, which is completely Definitely. unbiased, so that I'm not biased looking at my own knee. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. And it's, you know, my knees are never infected, but my, my colleagues always are. <laughs> uh, so um, it's always worth someone else putting a, an independent view on it, because we will always be hoping because we're, we're so invested in that patient that we don't want it to be um you need an independent view and that's where the whole you know team working bit becomes so important you know this is not stuff to do as a lone ranger um you you do need your colleagues around you for when it goes wrong but also just to give you a bit of a common sense check occasionally when um you've got your blinkers on so yeah excellent point hi guys uh, i'm very uh Fascinating discussion, uh, Nikhil, Andrew, and Radian. This is Yogesh here from Cardiff Studio. Uh, would you be kind enough to answer some of the questions the delegates have been putting on the chat? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the one of the question uh, 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 Devendra Kurana wants to know is that if, for your second case, if the aspiration is negative, would you go as far as doing the synovial or bone biopsy for the suspected low-grade infection? So this is from the, the first two cases? No, no, this, is, this is the last case which you put in uh, 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 just now for the infection region. That's yours. Yeah, no, so for me, um, the, the two groups are spread. The ones that are obviously infected, not only needed the organism, and those are the, the painful, swollen, unhappy knees, and they're the ones you do in theatre. Uh, and I, I personally have a low threshold for doing EUA, aspiration, arthroscopy, um, and taking synovial biopsies, if I'm in any doubt. Most of the time, you know, you, you've taken the history, you've examined the patient, you've got some uh, baseline blood profile, uh, and then you draft your first aspiration. And most of the time, you'll get everything you need. You can throw in Synovasure, leukocyte esterase tests, uh, D-dimers. There's lots of other tests out there of, of increasing expense. Uh, but I have no problem in repeating bloods, repeating aspiration, if I'm in any doubt. 
And certainly, arthroscopy is a big part, or increasing part, of my work up for complex cases. Thank you. And for the first case, the Vikram Desai wants to know, you know, the, when the wound was leaking after your primary total knee replacement, he said, is there any role for using the suction dressing a bit earlier? Yeah, so I think that's um, something we, we try to sort of cover a little bit, that if I've got a, a patient who is high risk, so they are diabetic on steroids and they are obese, uh, I will probably put a negative pressure dressing and pick whichever one you like, but we've got the Pico in, in our theatres. I will probably put that on in theatre. If it's a standard wound, but just the next morning the dressing is really soaked and uh, I'm worried I'll put a Pico on with that first dressing change. So an early use of negative pressure uh, for the high-risk ones, or if you're having a problem at 24, 48 hours, I think would be my advice. Yeah, Thank I'll, you. I'll throw into that extension splintage and rest. Yeah. Yeah, so really old-fashioned orthopedics, but it works. Yeah. Thank, thank we, you very much. Over to Nikhil. Pleasure. Uh, if we go on to our, our next case here, uh, primary knee 2009. So then at that point, this man was only 50. Uh, persisting wound leakage and had a debridement. Uh, then had a revision, which was in within five or six years because of loosening of the base plate. Uh, and then a subsequent further two-stage revision uh, before the patient was referred. So Ridin, any sort of... Um, warning bells and red flags that are talking to you from this case. Yeah, so, so, so I'm listening to that and I'm thinking this was infected from day one, wasn't it? You know, he, he's had a debris mom, maybe they, didn't, maybe they didn't identify an organism, he's loosened early, again, was it infected, low-grade organism, and then eventually the infection has, has come out. Mm -hmm. So I think this has been a primary infection from day one. You may not be able to prove it, but that, that's what worries me. Um, and, and, also, and also, uh, doing half a revision, doing a tibial only revision uh, in 2013. Was that the case, or did they revise both? Under? Yeah, it was. It was just the the tibial base plate. I think that was revised. Yeah, and again, that too. That's, that's maybe a whole different topic. But partial revisions. Uh, there's evidence for and against. I'm very very selective in when I do partial revisions, and if there's any inkling of infection, I do the whole thing. You know, I may do one stage, maybe two stage, but I'll do the whole thing. But so I think this has been a low-grade blood infection all the way along, and, and, and I assume it still is. Yep. So, I mean, th these were the x-rays when he was uh, sent down for, for an opinion. Um, and obviously, uh, obviously loose on the femur, possibly loose on the tibia, definitely infected, um, and uh, still a, um, a staph as the, uh, the organism... Uh, which turned out to be the same organism as when they did the the first washout uh, some years back. Um, Andrew, could I ask? Um, yeah. So one of the mistakes I've made in the past is to think the patella is really well fixed and patella revisions are really difficult. So maybe I've left in ones I should have taken out. Yeah. Was the, was this here? Was it had you had the, the patella revised previously, or is it a you know I've seen it before the primary patella has been left in despite several revisions and it's still infected. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, I've only once ever left a patella in with an infected case when it was a, an uncemented uh, one where I, I knew I would just fracture the extensor mechanism by getting it out. Um, but otherwise, I think if there's infection there, you've got to get the patella button out. And if you're left with a shell at the next stage, well, that's a problem for another day. Um, the infection is the main problem. Um, and so, yes, still infected. Um, and so obviously here I've, I've gone for a, a static spacer. Um, one could argue a mobile, but he's already on a third or fourth procedure um, with infection and major bone loss as well. Um, so do you want to just make a, a comment on the perhaps the static spacer you would use, Ridin? Because I think it's, it's pretty um, similar to what we yeah, would it's, do. It's very similar. And looking at this x-ray, I can see you've got um, the carbon fibre rods in the middle there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, so you see the outline of those, the shadow, and around it um, looks like several mix of cement. So I can see little islands in the cement. So you've added antibiotics in there. So yep. you've got a very broad spectrum antibiotic um, spacer. Um, it's a third revision now, maybe fourth revision. You've got to worry about soft tissues um, and contracture. And 
if you go to static spacer, then it's going to be a tight knee at the end. So I'm assuming you're going to be planning a hinge mechanism second time so you can release extensively. Yeah. And knowing you can put a hinge in successfully, static space allows you to treat that infection better, I think, by resting the, the limb, resting the bones, but in particular, resting the soft tissues. Yeah. And I, I think we'd have the same philosophy that where possible, if the bone loss is minimal, the soft tissues are good, go mobile, the function's a bit better and the tissues are a bit better when you go back. Uh, if it's getting more of a disaster case, just let it all rest, uh, keep it static and come back another day. Uh, and you can see a tubercle um, <clears throat> coming off there for the uh, the access because he was pretty stiff. Um, and one of the issues, not specifically a topic for today, but obviously bone loss uh, becomes an issue to try and deal with as well. Um, and lots of different ways to, to skin that cat, whether you go with cones or sleeves, Subtle differences, but probably for most cases doesn't make a big difference which you choose. It's the system you're familiar with. Um, and uh, obviously just trying to sort of reconstruct it. Um, but all of that is secondary. That's the fun bit to do later if and when you've cleared infection. So all of this makes um, no sense at all if you haven't cleared the infection. Completely. Um, and the grid slides, Andrew, showing how radical the, the approach has to be, how radical the debris bone has to be, and your reconstruction fixation. We have many options now, but it doesn't matter what you use. If you haven't debrided, you haven't done things properly, you, you don't get that second chance. Yeah, and it, it is, I think, part of the, the issue of the right people doing it is the people who are used to doing big exposure, used to being able to remove dead bone because they're not worried they can reconstruct that later they can debride capsules and out the back of the knee if they need to um because they know they can help deal with that um i think if you're tentative you don't do this often uh you, you will perhaps not be as aggressive with your debridement um so, andrew one of the most enlightening moments of my uh, career in reading infections was radian's description of the tricyclic debridement yeah. At first, I thought he was jesting that we need to go on tricyclic antidepressants when you get an infection. <laughs> but Ridian, if you wouldn't mind, just uh, summarizing that concept that you have so beautifully Nick, described. Nick, if I can just pause you there, because on yeah. our summary take-home slide, ah, excellent. We, okay. we have that exact uh, process of Ridian's to go through. But excellent. essentially, just to finish off this case, because I know we're, we're getting towards the end of our time, if you can clear the infection then you can get back the function and the reconstruction and everything else. Uh, but the, clearing the infection is the important bit. And then I think because we are um, coming up to sort of about five or, or so minutes left on what we've got, if I just skip through the one other case we were going to discuss, uh, which was quite similar, um, and go on to this debriding slide. Um, now, uh, it's something I, I've been going on about for a couple of years. Ridian's certainly been going on about it for a lot longer and raised, as you said, all our awareness about it. So he needs great credit for doing that. Um, but there are a lot of stages to the process of debridement. Um, the bit I've added is the uh, the bit like the 1980s shampoo adverts, which is where you have to lather, rinse and repeat uh, and keep doing it until it's clean. Uh, but perhaps, Ridian, if you can talk us through the other steps that you've uh, sort of popularized so, so it's not uh, so mine is ever so slightly different to uh, andrews but very marginally so i talk about um surgical mechanical and chemical uh surgical being exposure explantation cutting out any obvious dead bone and, and, and membrane mechanical when you ream the, ream the canals up and down you're scratching correcting the bone surfaces and using high power pulse lavage always high power myself to both wash out any debris, but also if there's any biofilm left over, high power lavage makes the dermatis. So when you do your next cycle of mechanical surgical cleaning, it's a bit more obvious what you take it out. And I, that, I do that two or three times, then I finish with a, uh, a chemical attack. And uh, under tonica, I'll use hydrogen peroxide, alcoholic lexidine, and acetic acid, they're my poisons of choice. But there are modern ones available, back tissues out there at a cost. Mm -hmm. Prohexidine, definitely, Beradine works, lots of things. I would tend to use chemicals in combination and you choose your poison. Um, yeah. 
but you know it's it's that cyclical thing. It's about having a stepwise approach. Instead of you know, I look at other people's uh, lectures. They say I did a radical to breed more, a tumor-like to breed more, an aggressive to breed more. Well, that's just subjective terms. You have to define the steps you are going to use again and again, so you can get reproducible results. Yeah, and, and again, I think that's yeah, all the infection work sort of uh, succeeds or fails on your debridement and the antibiotics help a bit afterwards. This, this is becoming a more common medical legal allegation as well now. So recently I've come across at least three cases where the allegation has been that the surgeon did not perform an adequate debridement because it wasn't documented in the methodical manner that it was done. And then it's very difficult to defend such a case where you haven't documented each and every step that you have done properly. Yeah. No, I think that's a, that's a fair point. And as we're sort of coming towards the, the end of the session, uh, Rudy and I just had a couple of uh, things that we thought were useful take-home messages. Um, but use the resources to keep yourself up to date. There's a, a lot of stuff that's come out of the Basque Revision Knee Working Group in the last year, a number of articles and symposia in the knee, uh, as well as a specific post uh, on uh, PJI in the knee, which you can get off the, the BOA website. Um, Perhaps the other bits summarizing what we did earlier, active management of your early leaky wounds. So don't just watch them, do the interventions with the negative pressure, the rest, the elevation, the stopping the anticoagulants. If it's prolonged dues, it's serious, get the second opinion and have a low threshold for taking them back to theater. If they septic presenting on call, it's about sepsis support, getting a sample and starting antibiotics. You may want to intervene with your first aid, wash out for the septic load, but properly treating that infection is done at another time. In terms of DARE, um, do it if it's a good implant that's well fixed with a short duration of infection in an optimized patient. And it's an extensive debridement with the documented stages we've talked about. And it's not by a junior out of hours. This is a sort of consultant level attempt at saving a joint. Um, there will be some parts of the country, uh, either in parts of Wales or Ireland, where the network system that's coming in may not be rolled out there at this stage. But even if you're not working in a system with a network, you must have a departmental pathway for how you discuss these, how you refer these, uh, and uh, whose friend you have uh, on fast dial to be able to discuss the, the cases with. Uh, I know mine's Ridian, so... Uh, uh, <laughs> It's always good to have a good friend in the background. It's um, really big, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then perhaps the final thing, just to, to round up the PJI thing, is always try and get the organism because that's going to be your key for any of your medical management. Always do a good debridement because that's probably the, the most important step of all of it. Uh, and then with the new network systems that are coming out, it's a case of trying to get the right surgeon in the right unit in an MDT network type situ situation uh, to do that job and then developing those networks and relationships so that the, the units that do some revisions but maybe not very complex ones, you find the right threshold in your area for what you discuss, what you hang on to, what you send on um, because for the patient at the end of the day, getting the right intervention the first time around um, is certainly going to help with this infection work. Um, but um, Nick, I think from, from Ridian and myself point of view, those were the main messages, but obviously are there other questions or anything else you want to put to us? So there were two things that uh, if you can, you know, share your, your wisdom with us, one is the, the, the culture negative infection. So you have got infection, but you've tried your best and you can't get the organism. And uh, that's becoming increasingly common according to what Parvizi was saying last month in one of the updates he gave. And the second point was about seronegative infections, where your bloods are normal, but uh, you know that there's an infection. What's your experience or view on that? So the, um, everybody gets culture negative infections if, if they've got a decent series. Uh, I was in Cardiff uh, about between 14 and 18%. Jay Parvizi talks 25 to 30%. And, and I... Uh, I think that's a bit high, to be honest. And uh, I've got to ask uh, why they're a lot higher in Philadelphia than they are in other parts of the country. But every series you look at should be reporting culture negatives because they exist. And um, that may be culture negative pre-surgery, uh, 
perioperatively, when you do multiple sampling, you should increase your yield. Um, in terms of what you do with it, uh, again, it's philosophy. For me, a culture negative infection, I'll treat exactly the same as a culture positive. I.e., I'll make a decision on one or two stage based on the patient primarily, the limb, and the organism to a lesser extent. The data that is published out there, and that includes my own series, um, will tell you that culture negatives do just as well. Whether you do a one or two stage makes no difference. The culture negatives are generally low threshold organisms, low virulence organisms, uh, sensitive organisms. So I wouldn't worry too much about them. Um, but that's easy for me to say. I think we've got to have a debate about how we do this. I don't know that the, the boss would say in culture negative equals two stage. That's a debate we can have. Yeah. Andrew, you maybe think differently? I, I think the only other comment I'd make, I'd make is that some of the microbiologists will tell you that the way things are cultured in different hospitals is different. So occasionally uh, having a more reference centre PJI place do your samples, you might get a few less. Um, they may not culture, but you can also do things like send off a PCR, which um, micros will routinely do if there's concern about that. Um, but at the end of the day, there will sometimes be ones that you just know are infected clinically or on histology, for example, um, and you just can't name the bug. Uh, and that's when you have to go broad spectrum. But also think of the the weird ones uh, like TB or funguses and, and so on, which you may not have cultured appropriately for the first time around. That's great. Thanks. Just, just you know, we'll wrap up in one minute, but uh, just in just your take home message about zero negative infections, where the bloods are normal. What's your so, experience with that? So they classically, that would be the coagulus negative, the low virulence infections. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, 5% of all infections have a negative CRP. It, yeah. it just is. Um, that's why, look, we don't rely on one test. You know, it's about the history, the examination, x-rays, bloods, repeating them, aspirations, biopsies. It's everything together. Um, and then you can add in the most expensive tests you want. None of them are at 100%. We still have about the 95 to 98% uh, efficacy with almost all tests. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. So, Andrew and Rudian, thank you very much for a wonderful session. It was certainly very educational for me. I hope um, our audience has uh, enjoyed it. So, um, with your permission, we'll sign off. Thank, thank you. you very much. Pleasure. Thank you.